That's one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. That phrase has echoed for the last 50 years because this summer is the anniversary of the first footsteps on the moon by the Apollo 11 crew. And today, I'd like to tell you a little bit more about that with some very interesting models. This is the famous picture of the Apollo 11 crew walking on the moon and Neil Armstrong being the first man on the moon. Unfortunately, if you wanna see Neil Armstrong on the moon, you're gonna to have to look in the, vi in the visor of Buzz Aldrin because there is actually the picture of Neil Armstrong. He took cameras, he took movies, he did experiments. We don't have a good picture of him as he landed on the moon. But with these models and these artifacts, I hope to explain to you how this Saturn V rocket took the first people to the moon. A rocket, uh, this model, which is a 1 to 144 scale, you can get an idea of the size of the people. It was one of the largest rockets ever to lift off. And it was a seven day journey to the moon and back with the astronauts up here in the command module. Let's check it out. So before we talk about the rocket that went to the moon, let's talk about where the moon is. So this drawing is not to scale. We have the sun, which would be six feet in diameter for an earth <laughs> the size of a marble. And we have the earth 92 million miles away. And we have the moon or Luna 237,000 miles away. So this is not to scale, but we put it like this so you could understand it better. Here is something that might help you understand scale just a little bit better. If this is the moon right here, and here is uh, the earth and the moon, really at this different scale, the moon would be something like way over here, quite a distance for people to go, but small by solar system and universe standards. So if you take a look up here at our drawing, another thing that made this going to the moon so impossible and interesting was that the earth is always rotating and revolving. So here we have the earth here on its axis rotating and it is also going around the sun and it takes a year to go around the sun, 24 hours to rotate, but the moon is revolving around the earth and it's synchronized with its rotation. So the, although we always see the same side of the moon, it is rotating and revolving. So here's our problem. How are we going to leave the earth and get to the moon when it's not going to be in that same spot and neither is the earth? So think of the math and the calculations that took. Basically, you're going to have to launch to a place, a time, a place and a time somewhere else. So as the earth is rotating, the moon is going to be here and then the moon's going to be here in several days. So what happened is when the Apollo Saturn V rocket launched, it launched in the same direction as the Earth because it used the Earth's speed to increase its velocity. If it went the other way, it'd be like trying to run backwards. So it go, went around one and a half times around the Earth, gaining speed, firing different stages of rockets, and headed towards the moon. Most of the time on the way to the moon, it's coasting. It's used up all its fuel. It started from a huge rocket to a small rocket, which we'll see soon. Now, the funny thing is, this moon is now moving. So by the time it got to the moon, three days into the flight, the moon has moved. So it gets to the moon, and it starts an orbit around the moon. And as it's going around the moon about the 13th time, two of the astronauts leave the command ship and the service module and get in the limb or the lunar module and land on the moon. One astronaut, Michael Collins, is left in the command module going around the moon by himself. While they're on the moon, the moon is still rotating. And so a day later, it's time to leave. Now the moon is over here. They catch up, they, they lift off of the surface of the moon on the ascent stage. They dock again with the command module fire their last rockets, and head back to Earth. And of course, the Earth is not here. It's farther along on its revolutions, and it's over here, and they get back. Think about that math. 
So in this model of the Saturn V rocket, you can see it's all assembled there at Kennedy Space Center. Back then it was called Cape Canaveral. And it's named Kennedy now because President John F. Kennedy in 1961 addressed the nation and directed NASA before the end of the decade to put a man on the moon and bring him back. Now that feat, he said, was not because it's easy, but just the opposite, because it was hard to do. And by doing so, we would learn so much more. You see, we were in the space race against the Russians who had done all the first in space, the first to send a satellite, Sputnik, the first to go around the earth, the first to walk in space, this first animal in space, a dog. But they had not been to the moon, and that was going to be our first. And so you see here, this rocket has different stages. First stage, second stage, third stage, and then a rocket up here in the service module. Now, the reason it has stages is an age-old problem for shooting a rocket off of the Earth. And it goes something like this. As this rocket stages burn up, they use their fuel. And they're empty of fuel, but the actual mass of these rockets are so big that now you're still pushing that mass. So you can't bring enough fuel to lift off of the earth if you still contain the gas or the fuel tank. So to solve this, they have broken this into different stages using each one, discarding it, going faster and faster and less and less mass. Let's take a closer look at these stages. Okay, so let's look at these stages. And here's, I'm going to lay this one down. Here is the capsule falling to earth. <laughs> here is the upper part of the rocket right here. And here's another stage right about here. And here's our first stage right here. Now, you can see each of these stages are quite large. This is the first stage. As it goes up, it uses all the fuel. This was actually kerosene and oxygen. Very heavy, very combustible. And as it went up, off this went, and it was sent to tumble and splash somewhere probably in the Indian Ocean. Uh, and so this was our first stage. Next was our second stage. This stage was used to go around the Earth faster and faster, increasing velocity. And so this was used all up, mostly hydrogen and oxygen. It was gone. And so why take these in the space to the moon when they're just dead weight? So they are jettisoned or undocked, which leaves this very interesting piece here, which is a huge third stage and a special escape velocity rocket. This rocket right here was attached to the command or capsule command module, uh, which in case there was any kind of problem, this could have taken off and pulled them away from the, uh, the wreckage if there was, but luckily this was not used. So this was jettisoned away, leaving these three pieces right here. Now, what's really interesting is, let me show you what we had to do before we go to the moon. Okay, so now we've had a, our, one of our last burns, and we have this configuration headed to the moon. This part is pretty fascinating. Before they could go to the moon, one thing they had to do, which they learned in some of the earlier space programs, the Mercury program, getting a person in space, the Gemini program, being able to two people and being able to dock or hook up with something in space. And so one of the first things they had to do, which is to me is just amazing, that they designed this to open up, this part opened up, and they came apart. They had to use a bunch of rockets on this command module to turn it around. Now, mind you, they're going thousands of miles an hour towards the moon. Turn around and redock with the lunar module inside of here, and then pull the lunar module out. And then this was sent either around the Earth or discarded, the last stage, the third stage. So now you have this interesting configuration headed towards the moon. The lunar module, it has two parts, the command module and the service module. The first thing they have to do is they have to turn this around and it's, remember, it's headed towards the moon, but there's the sun out there. And if it stays in one position, one side will get incredibly hot, one side will be frozen. So they use the rockets to set up a slow three times an hour rotation. And they are slowly now moving towards the moon, leaving the gravitational influence of the Earth behind. And in a day and a half, two days, close to three days, they entered 
the moon's gravitational influence. So the whole time they're headed towards the moon, the astronauts, the three of them, you know, uh, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins are living in the command ship and they can have access in what's called the LIM or the lunar module. Now, so there's actually four parts to this. As they got closer to the moon, they started going around and pulled into the orbit of the moon. And if the Earth is over here, when they go on what's called the dark side of the moon, they lose all contact with the Earth and it's called loss, loss of signal, because the moon blocks any kind of transmissions. So that's pretty cool, being that far from the Earth, completely out of contact with the Earth. So after about 13 of these revolutions, lunar revolutions, it was time for two of the astronauts to leave the command module and get into the lunar module. And that was Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. And they have to separate. And when they separated, Michael Collins is left in the command module orbiting the moon by himself. And you might say, maybe the loneliest man in the world, the farthest from any other humans without radio contact. So now the really interesting part comes. People in Houston at uh, Mission Control are monitoring this, and it's time, you're going thousands of miles an hour, it's time to land on the moon. And they have two different rockets. Uh, on the bottom, this is called the descent stage. And this top part is the ascent stage. The two astronauts climb inside here. They're standing up. They're going so fast. And they've already picked a landing site, a flat area called the Sea of Tranquility. Now, the Sea of Tranquility, there's no water, surface water on the moon. But these flat areas are called Mars, uh, which I believe is French for sea, uh, Mariner, Mar are relatively flat compared to the craters. Since the moon has no atmosphere, any meteorite or meteorite that hits the moon has made massive craters. So they have to land here. They're going slow, burning slow. When you slow down, you go down. It's actually time to land on the moon. They're monitoring everything. They overshot their initial landing because they looked out the window and there were large boulders. And so Neil Armstrong, taking control, lands with eight seconds left of fuel. And they didn't know when they landed if the lunar module would sink 20 feet, 10 feet, two inches into the lunar dust. Luckily, it didn't. It landed with those famous words. Houston, the eagle has landed. This is tranquility, sea of tranquility. The eagle has landed. This was called the eagle. And of course, this was called Columbia on the Apollo 11. Now, the first thing they did was they uh, turned on the outside movie camera, and we watched from a camera on the side of this lander, this limb lander, we watched as Neil Armstrong opened the door in his spacesuit and slowly descended down these steps. And as 650 million people around the world on the afternoon evening of July 20th, 1969, I remember being in my grandparents' front room watching on a black and white television here in Indianapolis, Indiana, along with the rest of the world, because it wasn't just an American astronaut, it was the first human ever to be on the moon. He said these as he stepped down off of that leg. That's one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. It still brings chills uh, to the back of my head to hear that and to be able to see that. Now, he had to do what's called an EVA, an extravicular activity. And let's talk about that next. So, the EVA, the extravehicular activity. Uh, there were about five different scientific missions on board. Number one was the first thing to do is pick up samples, moon rocks. A lot of these moon rocks are kept in two places here in the United States now. One of them is down at... Uh, Houston at the NASA uh, Command Center, and uh, we had to bring those rocks back. The second thing we did was to film it. They set a camera up, a color camera, and take pictures because we had never been there. Uh, some of the instruments they set up was a really cool reflector, a laser retro reflector. So you could send a laser from the Earth and measure how long it took as it bounced back to get the exact distance of the Earth. They hooked up a seismograph to see if there were any, not earthquakes, but moonquakes. In fact, later when objects hit the moon, they could use that seismograph 
to determine is there a mantle or crust? Is there a core to the moon? And, and finally, they, they hooked up a catcher of the solar wind. The, the particles that come through our galaxy, our universe, our solar system that sometimes get moved or blurred or obstructed by our atmosphere, no atmosphere, great place to collect it. And the last experiment they wanted to do, they developed a thing called a cordless battery drill. We use them every day. That was invented by the NASA spinoff department. A cordless drill to drill down and bring back a core sample of what it might look like under the surface of the moon. Once they did all that, they had about an hour, hour and a half. Uh, Buzz Aldrin followed uh, Neil Armstrong down. They did their EVAs for about an hour or so. Buzz Aldrin went back, Neil Armstrong. Then they were told, lock the hatch, get some sleep. Now the cool thing is, I think one of them slept on the floor and one of them slept in a hammock. Now this is the first time in days that they had any gravity, one sixth of the gravity of the earth, but you could actually lay down. You can't lay down up in the capsule. It was time to get back into uh, docking with the uh, command module and the service module, which Michael Collins, the whole time had been going around the moon by himself while these guys were having all the fun down here. So what happens? This is kind of cool. This is a, called an ascent stage. And so at a certain time, this part right here would come apart easier than my model. And the rocket here would blast off. And there's a rocket under there. And it would catch up as it went around. It would catch up with the command module and dock together, and that was kind of cool. They had learned this in the Gemini program of how to dock. Without that, they would never have been able to go to the moon. The astronauts then, uh, as it docked, came from that opening right there into that opening there. All three of them were back on board. This was not needed anymore. It was dead weight, so it was jettisoned and sent to crash into the moon. That impact would send moon quakes through to be picked up by the science of the McGrath. Now it's time to go back. They do a burn and we'll check it out. So most of the mission complete. We launched, we docked, we went to the moon, we orbited the moon, we landed on the moon and safely returned to the command module with just enough fuel and oxygen and food and air to get back to the earth. So they fire the rockets, and now it's a three-day journey back to the Earth. And, of course, it was a pretty cool time that all that happened. There was televised uh, back to their families. And they're now they're getting closer to the Earth. They've left the influence of the moon. Now we're getting closer to the influence of the Earth's gravity. Faster until now we're out of fuel. So let's why, why take this with us? Let's separate. So they separate the command module, which is about the size of a large uh, uh, van or RV. Not, uh, not anywhere near a bus. Now they're inside of it, and they're going thousands of miles an hour into the Earth's atmosphere. There's a problem. The Earth's atmosphere is dense compared to space. All the air running across it is going to catch on fire. In fact, it's called LOS, loss of signal. The air is on fire ionizing, and so they have to deal with this. The bottom of this capsule is made of a special ablative material designed to absorb the heat and possibly melt. As they go faster and faster in the atmosphere, the thicker it gets, the closer they get. And at the same time, in the Indian Ocean, the USS Hornet, one of the largest aircraft carrier in the world, with all kinds of satellites, helicopters, binoculars, everybody looking for the return of the Apollo 11. They spot it as the three parachutes come out, and this thing lands and splashes down in the Indian Ocean, surrounded by U.S. Navy SEAL men that jump in, inflate the uh, capsule, remove the astronauts, and head them back to the ship. So once they came back to Earth, of course, they were instant heroes. You know, they, they were quarantined for about a week because we didn't know what kind of germs they may bring back. But it's kind of famous. And, you know, I, I want to tell you, the people who went to the moon, the men and the women who made it possible, had a love for science, math, and technology. And, in fact, Neil Armstrong, you know, he, there's a great article in, in my Academy of Model Aeronautics, from free flight to space flight. As a kid, as a three-year-old, he made model airplanes and flew them. As he got older, he made more. He, he went to Purdue University, got a degree in aeronautical engineering. He went in the Navy, but he once famously said, 
His interest in aeronautics, which led him to the moon, was because he made models as a kid. So who knows, you kids watching this today, the models you make today might go from free flight to space flight. You might be the next kid that heads to the moon in some future flight. I just hope I live long enough to see it.